please join me in welcoming filmmaker Morgan Neville. Thank you so much. So the credits will continue, and all of your okay. collaborators will be recognized. It's okay. And we like to let the credits play here, but uh, I get it. We started but a little late, so I apologize. How's everybody doing? Good. <clears throat> such a tough ending. I mean, not tough ending, but it's such an emotional ending. Yeah. Um, it gets me every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Congratulations on the movie, Morgan. Welcome Thank back you. to the Film Society of Wicked yeah. Center. We're glad to have you back on this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations. <clears throat> um, I want to talk with you about your own relationship to uh, Mr. Rogers and his neighborhood. And I, just to give myself a reference point, I looked up your, your birth date. Uh -huh. um, and I think I was born a year after you, but like two days bef before you on the 8th. October. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're in the same zone. And I was just thinking about <clears throat> my own. You know, you can't watch this movie without thinking about your own relationship to the show and what it, what it meant to you. Um, and I know for me, watching this film, um, you watch and you learn about Fred Rogers from a whole different perspective than you could have when you're a you know six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kid. Yeah. So I wonder uh, if you could share your own experience with the show as a kid, and then and then and then how you came back yeah. to it. Well, yeah, I was born in 1967. The show went on in '68, so I was the first generation Mr. Rogers fan. So I was probably watching in him when I was one two, three, the show was really designed, he said, for two to six year olds. Yeah. So in a way, my relationship with him predates my memory. You know, Likewise. he was somebody like, Likewise. next to my family, I'm trying to think of anybody else I have a relationship with that, that's that old, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I loved it as a kid. Um, but when I think back about watching the show, um, I, I don't have a lot of specific memories. It's more like a general, warm feeling and images and you know it's all kind of hazy but it, it was very positive um and then like most people i didn't think about him for for decades um mm -hmm. and it was really um over the past eight years that i started to think about him differently uh, i'd done a film with yo-yo ma called the music of strangers and yo-yo was friends with with Mr. Rogers and talked about him often. And every time he talked about him, it surprised me. It was something I didn't expect. And I even used a little clip of, of Yo-Yo on Mr. Rogers in that film. And there was just, it got me thinking about him in a different way. And once my antenna was up like that, I kept coming across things, not just viral videos, but mm -hmm. um, mentions of him. And every time it surprised me. And this all led me to maybe two and a half years ago, uh, I found myself somehow very late at night on YouTube watching Mr. Rogers' speeches <laughs> at uh, commencement addresses. And um, I just had this kind of profound experience where I, fe it, I felt like it wasn't like I needed to go back and revisit this voice from my child. It was, where's this voice today? Like he sang some incredibly grown up, empathetic stuff that I feel like that type of voice I just don't hear in our culture. And part of me was just feeling like, I want to see if there's more here and if I could maybe make a film about it. I mean, I remember waking up the next day and my, I turned to my wife and I said, um, is it a crazy idea to make a film about Mr. Rogers? Like, can you make a, a serious film about Mr. Rogers? What do you think? I will say my wife is a children's librarian, um, so she's maybe a little biased <laughs> in these ways. And she, sa she said yes, she said yes, yes, yes. Um, and then I uh, talked to uh, Karen Capitosta, one of my producers, and mentioned it, and she loved the idea. And then I called Nicholas Ma, uh, who's Yo-Yo's son, who's a filmmaker, and who knew the Rogers and was on the show a couple of times. And I asked him, and he said, absolutely. You know, I just the the instant idea of yes, this needs to happen. Um, so Nicholas is my other producer, and they're they're both here tonight. So my two producers, wave guys, <laughs> and that that then sent us off on this journey to make the film. And then the question is, well, what we had we had these 
ideas, but the idea, then the question is, what is the film? Because in many ways, Mr. Rogers is like the quintessential two-dimensional figure, you know, in popular conception. And so I think as we started to do research, um, the thing that I came up with is that it's really about the ideas. And so when we first sat down with Joanne Rogers, my pitch to her, because they had never given permission for anybody to do anything, and I said, I wanna do this, and you can't control anything. You have to just give it to me. But this is what I wanna do. I don't wanna make a film about the biography of Fred Rogers. I wanna make a film about the ideas of Fred Rogers. And she loved that idea. And she said, besides, Fred had always said, if anybody made a film out of his life, it'd be the most boring film of all time. So, <laughs> so she that's, liked the idea of the that's ideas. A good challenge it was a good though, challenge. I'm and but it. I still had doubts. Um, and that was when two and a half. Two, yeah, that, that was probably the very beginning of 2016. Okay. And we then went to the Fred Rogers Center in Latrobe, his hometown outside of Pittsburgh, where they have all of his archives and everything, and it's amazing. They've been organizing it for years. It's like they've been organizing it, waiting for us to show up and make this film. And the first thing I did, I said, I want to see the Bobby Kennedy assassination special because I'd read about it. It aired one time and it was never seen again. And they put it up for me and I watched it. And at the end of it, I knew I had to make this film. Like any doubts I had about complex moral questions and dramatic tension and character, I didn't know what the answers were, but I knew I could find them. You know, or I knew that there was enough to work with and that gave me my toehold into making the film. It's interesting because you obviously couldn't, um, in early 2016, you couldn't have imagined where the country would be uh, in middle 2018 when, yeah. you know, someday the film might be released. But, and, and, but, but maybe you could. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like it, it's that? been in the the culture for a long time. I'm, I made a film three years ago called Best of Enemies about these debates between Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley. And that film is actually like the dark cousin to this film. Because <laughs> they're both about television in the same time period and about the potential, either as a cautionary tale about what can happen with TV or as a, hof a hopeful tale about the potential of what TV can do. But the, it's the same issue I've been focused on with a lot of my work, which is where do we find common ground through culture? And this, in a way, just felt like a story I wanted. Like I said, it was a voice I wanted to spend time with, but it was like a story that I just felt was important to, to talk about. I mean, we all felt like, you know, we kind of, we went in, into this interesting kind of bubble of spending 2017 basically just living in the land of make-believe, listening to Mr. Rogers and working on the film and talking about it. And it just was so, um, so cathartic to live with that kind of positivity. And, and not in a, you know, what I like about what Fred talked about, it was, it was never about denying that there's negativity in the world. There was nothing Pollyanna-ish, as he would say, about it. Um, it's acknowledging bad things and trying to process them and work through them. And that's essentially what he did for kids. And it's essentially, you know, there's a whole lot of unprocessed trauma in our culture today. And as an adult, I feel it. Um, but the idea of trying to make sense in some way of how we ended up here, um, I think Fred would think about it in terms of, I mean, he always talked about love and fear being these two poles, and so love is something we aspire to, but fear is something we have to acknowledge, because fear, for him, left untreated, becomes anger and hatred and resentment and all these other things, but underneath those things is fear, and children are trying to understand the world, and they're trying to, they're fearful about things, so he's trying to explain things, he's trying to level with kids and say, there are bad things, he's doing shows about death and divorce and war for two to six year olds, yeah. you know? And kids know bad things are happening. Not hiding it, not sheltering it. Yeah, not and that- Pretending it doesn't exist. That kind of honesty um, works for kids, but it also works for adults. It does. 
Um, I want to pick up on something you said a minute ago, and you said that your work, you try to find uh, common ground through culture. Where did that come from for you? Where did, where did that, uh, that goal or that, that driving sort of idea come from in your own life? I, I mean, I think it's part of my personality. Uh -huh. It's interesting. I mean, I started my career um, in political journalism. <laughs> so, you know, um, my first job out of college was at The Nation magazine. And then I went to work as Gore Vidal's fact checker. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I love politics and, I, and all of that, but, um, but I felt like my real drive was always towards culture. And it took me a few years to realize that I could actually make art and film around culture rather than just politics. You know, I kind of had this epiphany when I was 25 that you know, maybe the thing I was obsessed with in my off hours could be the thing I did in my daytime work. And I decided to make my first documentary. That was 25 years ago this month. I started my first documentary. So this is my anniversary. 25 years. 25 years. Thank you. Somehow I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. We might have time for one more. Yeah. Um, for you, 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 you were able to spend um, much more time in the world of Mr. Rogers the last few years than, than we've been. Uh, we've just had the opportunity yeah. to spend um, 95 minutes or so. Um, what surprised you? What, what, was, what, um, what was unexpected for you or what was surprising to you in the process of, of investigating, exploring, and reorient, re, 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 uh, connecting with this world? Well, about him and about the I world. Mean, so many things. I mean, everything about him was surprising in some way because I didn't understand, you know, beyond the cardigan, you know, <laughs> that, um, but at the same time, there was nothing shocking. It was, I mean, there are all these other things I don't even get into in the film. You know, he was a pacifist, teetotaling vegetarian who spoke multiple languages. He, um, lived this incredibly willful life. Um, and he was a real seeker. Uh, it's what I identified with as a documentary filmmaker, that he studied the world's religions. Even though he is Presbyterian, he not only studied Christianity, but he studied, you know, he spoke Hebrew, he studied Judaism, he spoke, you know, he studied Islam, he studied Buddhism. And what I think of his real mission was trying to look for the common humanist elements that exist in all of the world's religions and trying to distill that for kids to basically explain this is how we should be as act as people and how we should treat other people. And the profundity of that, I think, was the thing that I intuited, but I didn't understand. And you know, that, that was the thing that just inspired me over this past year and a half making the film. Um, the film opens. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah theater near you, so tell a friend. Yes. Um, there's like two minutes left. Uh, tell us, um, well, I, I think I know the answer to this one, but tell us what else you're working on before you leave us. <laughs> well, um, the next film's a little different. Um, it's about Orson Welles' last movie called The Other Side of the Wind. And maybe some of you have read that after 42 years, the negatives which have been in a vault in Paris were liberated and he shot this film for six years. It's a movie within a movie about a film director at the end of his life that can't finish a movie. And Orson never finished it. <laughs> so um, Frank Marshall and Peter Bogdanovich, a number, another of, a number of people that had worked on the film originally are finishing the film, but as a companion piece, I've been working on a film to explain what happened to Orson at the end of his life using both the movie and a lot of other material. And um, yeah, I, tonally, I would say it's it's quite different, but um, but also a very rewarding dive. Well, in your 25th year of doing this, what a big year you're having! Congratulations! Won't you be my neighbor? As Morgan said, opens this weekend. Tell a friend, spread the word. Um, we're gonna let you get on your way, but thank you for spending a few minutes with us. Thank you all so much.